And you can't convince me that a woman would write that. You simply can't. Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today, I wanted to talk about HBO's new show, The Idol. I know, I know, why would I want to contribute to the dog pile? I wanted to analyze this show so that you don't have to, but I also knew that if I merely just sat here and recap the entire show and picked apart everything that I hated about it, I would just be beating the deadest of horses because so many big creators and micro creators are covering the show, understandably so. So in this video, I wanted to talk about The Idol and how it fits into the broader context of Hollywood's problem with the male gaze and the sexualization of women to hopefully spark some necessary conversations about these topics. I just want to emphasize that I am critiquing the writing and direction of this show. I am well aware that the production of shows, especially this one, is complicated and aside from The Weeknd, who was one of the creators, with the other actors like Jenny, Troy, etc., we really don't know the extent to which they had control over what their character would say or do or how they would be portrayed or what their knowledge of what the series would be was when they signed on to it. So I'm not going to be making assumptions about them. I'm not going to be making big claims about them. I'm not going to be slandering them. I'm not here to do that. I will also be rephrasing and censoring some words like you will hear me say corn in this video and contextually you'll know what that means. I also wanted to give a trigger warning for this video. I won't be showing any explicit or triggering content obviously, but I will be talking about what happens in the show, so there will be content that is related to trauma, abuse, and mental illness. So I'm going to quickly run through what's happened in The Idol so far. I promise I'll be quick. If you know what happens already, you can check the timestamps below to move along. So I've watched the three episodes that are out so far, and apparently that's at least half the season because the whole season is supposed to be like five or six episodes. So overall, the story is supposed to explore the life of a pop star, Jocelyn, who had just had a breakdown the previous year because she was struggling with her mental health following her mom's death. So she's trying to make a big comeback and stand out in the industry and then she meets this cult leader named Tedros. In episode 1, Jocelyn is doing a photo shoot and practicing the choreography for her new upcoming song, World Class Center, and she's struggling a little bit. Meanwhile, her team becomes aware of this compromising photo of Jocelyn that's spreading on the internet and contrary to what some of them believe, it is the literal definition of revenge corn and should be taken seriously. They tell Jocelyn about the photo and then Jocelyn later goes to a club and meets Tedros and his rat tail. Then the next day he comes over to her house, listens to the single, and and proceeds to initiate a long, intimate ending sequence where he asphyxiates her and uses knife play to put it in the simplest terms. In episode 2, Jocelyn is struggling through the shoot of her music video for World Class Sinner, and her record label exec, Nikki, sees Diane, played by Jenny, who's one of Jocelyn's dancers, and sees potential in her. Diane is also revealed to be working with Tedros. Jocelyn breaks down, causing the shoot to be scrapped, and then later, Tedros comes over with some of the artists he works with, initiating a long ending sequence where they are intimate, naked, and singing to put it in the simplest terms. Then in episode 3, Jocelyn and Tedros are having a lot of sweat, a lot of it, very publicly. They go shopping at the Valentino store and then we learn how controlling Tedros is and he's been essentially taking over Jocelyn's life. Jocelyn's creative director, Xander, played by Troy Sivan, teams up with Tedros because they really want to help Jocelyn cement this bad girl image. And then we get the most interesting scene to come out of this show so far where Tedros and Xander are trying to convince Jocelyn to use the revenge corn photo of her as her album cover and she's not convinced and it turns into a standoff between Jocelyn and Tedros. The conversation ends with Tedros pressuring Jocelyn into sharing all of her trauma with the class, including how her mother used to abuse her with a hairbrush to get her to literally do anything. Cueing the most disturbing ending sequence, which I didn't think was possible, where Tedros uses the hairbrush to abuse Jocelyn to motivate her, I guess? Or, as he said in the show, to confront her pain in order to make art? Listen, I don't like the show and I'm not going to be watching any more of it. I also wanted to note that in episode 3, there is a character who makes a joke about Jeffrey Epstein and his crimes, and I don't think it's controversial to say that writing a joke like that is absolutely vile. So there's a lot to unpack and I first wanted to start by talking about the male gaze, and to talk about the male gaze and how the idol uses it, it's important to go over what that means. The male gaze is a term coined by feminist film critic 
critic Laura Mulvey in 1975, it refers to the way visual media such as films, advertisements, and art often depict the world from a straight male perspective, objectifying and sexualizing women for the presumed male viewer. According to Mulvey's theory, the male gaze operates in two different ways. The first is the camera's perspective. This is where, in visual media, the camera assumes the point of view of a straight male observer. It presents women as objects of desire, emphasizing their physical appearance, sexual attractiveness, and body. The second is narrative and character construction, which means that the male gaze also influences how the story is structured and told, and how female characters are portrayed. In the narrative sense of the male gaze, women are often not depicted as multidimensional characters, or they may lack agency, existing primarily to serve the values and desires of male viewers, or to serve the story arc of the male characters. The male gaze has been a subject of critique and analysis in feminist theory and media studies for its role in perpetuating patriarchal power dynamics and cultural perceptions. The concept is used to critically analyze how power, gender, and representation intersect in various contexts. It's also important to note that discussions about the male gaze is not just limited to film and TV, but also extends to other visual forms of media. The male gaze is also far from being a new thing as we've seen it throughout history and also in our everyday life. I don't think it comes as a surprise to people that there are discussions about the idol and the male gaze because one of the first pieces of rumored information that we got about this show was that the original director Amy Simetz or Amy Simetz was let go of the project and Sam Levinson was put on as a director because Amy brought too much of the female perspective. And there are absolutely many ways in which the idol has the male gaze. There are many times where the camera focuses on the women's bodies, especially Jocelyn's, and I don't think that this would be as much of a problem if it were balanced with the male characters, but it isn't. There are also parts of the story that are written in a way that really tells you that a man is telling the story. For example, Jocelyn is very quickly into Tedros, and as an audience member, I struggle to understand why or what attracted her to him. The show doesn't really give us anything on why Jocelyn let Tadris in, besides at the end of episode one, where Jocelyn's assistant says that she doesn't like Tadris's vibe and that he seems rapey, and then Jocelyn responds saying that that's what she likes about him. And you can't convince me that a woman would write that you simply can't. Or how they handle the whole revenge corn thing really seems like not a single woman touched the script. And I mean things specifically like the fact that when it happened, Jocelyn and her team not only did nothing but said that it wasn't that big of a deal. Or when Jocelyn was talking to the journalist from Vanity Fair and the journalist was like, why don't you go get the person who did this to you? And Jocelyn says, revenge is empowerment. When like, no, it's not revenge, it's charging someone for a literal crime that they did to you. Like revenge corn is a actual crime that seriously negatively affects a lot of women. They literally could have written Jocelyn a line where she mentions how our systems and structures let men get away with anything anyway, or how it would just be emotionally taxing for her to do that, because those are unfortunately reasons why women in Jocelyn's position don't do anything, but they didn't mention any of that. So just the way that the dialogue and some of these important plot points are written really feels like it's coming from a man's perspective. And on top of that, we don't really know Jocelyn. She's not a multi-dimensional character, and she's the main character. We only know her trauma and what she does for a living, but those are not what makes a person. And if you ask me to describe Jocelyn as a character after watching three nearly hour-long episodes, I would only be able to say that I think she's probably free-spirited and that she seems nice to other people, but that's it. And that's not a good thing. And then there's a part of the male gaze at work that many people have a problem with, and that's the oversexualization of female characters through gratuitous nudity and sex scenes. It's important to emphasize that the oversexualization of women in TV and film is a topic of ongoing debate and criticism. And from what I've seen from this debate, there are a lot of people that say that nudity and intimate scenes are very unnecessary and borderline, if not literally exploitative. And then there are also people saying that these are just bodies doing natural things. Why are we so afraid of it? So it's important to note that the over-sexualization of women in TV and film refers to the portrayal of female characters in a manner that excessively emphasizes their bodies or objectifies them, usually to gratify a presumed male viewer. It's seen as harmful because it can contribute to the normalization of objectification, perpetuate harmful gender stereotypes, and reinforce unequal power dynamics in real-life contexts. Critics also argue that the over-sexualization of women not only reinforces gender inequality, but also limits the diversity of female characters and limits a narrative the range of experiences that are portrayed. Obviously, nudity doesn't automatically equate to over-sexualization. It can be legitimate artistic expression used to convey themes, emotions, and narratives effectively. They may be appreciated as a form of artistic freedom, challenging social norms, or exploring the human body as a subject of aesthetic exploration. It's worth noting that context and purpose are essential factors in how nudity is perceived in visual media. When it's 
used in a thoughtful and meaningful way that aligns with the artistic vision of the piece of art, it can be seen as a valid artistic choice. However, if it's exploitative or completely unrelated to the themes or storytelling, it can be seen as objectifying or gratuitous. So obviously, whether nudity slash explicit content in a show or film is the latter is subjective, but I think a very simple question to ask in order to draw the line is, is this necessary? Or what am I trying to say with this? And with many existing examples, we'll find that it is unnecessary and it's not contributing to the storytelling or the themes. For example, we really didn't need to see Jocelyn get herself off two times in the first two episodes, and we also really didn't need to see her wake up naked in her bed multiple times. It also wasn't necessary to show us as many sex scenes as we've seen so far, and it's even more unnecessary to include the violent slash torture corn imagery. So a journalist at the Cannes Film Festival had asked the cast and creators of The Idol where they drew the line between being revolutionary and taking things too far with the explicit content and how they really felt about that. Sam Levinson's response was that sometimes things that might be revolutionary are taken too far. Then he went on to say that we live in a very sexualized world and that the influence of corn is really strong in terms of the psyche for young people and we see that in pop music. And when I first saw and heard this, my first thought was, okay, well, what are you trying to say about that in the idol? Because the problem I had while watching the show is that it seems to present these unnecessary problematic things without making commentary about it, without saying what needs to be said about it. Nothing about the first half of the show tells me that the show is trying to critique the influence of corn on young people. It's just showing sex and abuse in very explicit, uncomfortable scenes. And that's where the idol fell flat for me and didn't accomplish what it set out to achieve. Because apparently it's supposed to be satire, but you're not being satirical or critical by just showing us the thing that you say you're trying to criticize. And the sad part is that I see what the show could have been. Like, I see Tedros being controlling, I see how they try to give us context with Jocelyn's mental health to understand where she is mentally. I see that they give us crumbs of the relationship that Jocelyn has with her team and how her team really neglected to help her when she needed them. So there are these pieces that I can see of what could have been a really good story, but the idol and how it turned out just did not execute that well. I sincerely hope that if anything, this show sparks conversations about how the oversexualization of women and the male gaze has been in our media and continues to be in our media and something needs to change about that. I also hope that it shows people and starts conversations about how positions behind the camera like writers and directors are very male-dominated positions in the entertainment industry and that needs to be changed because we need more people who aren't men telling stories about people who aren't men. Apparently the show might not get a second season, which I think is probably for the better. I'm not going to be watching any more of the show because I feel like I've watched enough to know how I feel about it. It's going to continue to be told from a man's perspective and it's going to continue to show me elements of what could have been a really good story, but I'm just going to end up being disappointed and disturbed. But I hope that at the very least this video got someone out there to think about some piece of media differently or more critically. If you have other examples that I didn't mention or if you have any thoughts about how you feel about the male gaze in the entertainment industry, please comment below. If you disagree on what I've said in this video, I'm very curious and open to reading a respectful comment on why. Regardless, thank you for watching this video. I hope you got something out of it. Make sure you like this video and if you're new here and you like videos discussing TV shows, films, and unhinged pop culture stuff, make Make sure you subscribe to this channel as well.